Welcome back, everyone. And for those of you who are just joining in, my name is Sean Meister, and welcome to the Europe Markets Forum, where today our focus is on doing business in Germany. Before the break, we heard from Christopher McLean, Senior Trade Commissioner with the Canadian Embassy in Berlin. If you missed the session or any of these sessions, don't worry, as this entire forum will be available for on-demand viewing on June 8th. You can access all recorded presentations and downloadable materials starting on June 8th by using your same login and password that you use to access the platform today. Come back and visit as often as you wish. It is now my pleasure to welcome our next speaker, Jens Monka, Director for Germany with OCO Global. Jens is based in Frank the Frankfurt region and has more than 10 years of experience in foreign direct investment and international trade relations. He advises and accompanies economic development organizations with their strategic positioning for FDI and related trade and investment advisory programs. Jens has a background in economic development and has worked for NRW.invest, a leading German trade and investment promotion agency. Jens tells us that his presentation on doing business in the German market will provide an overview on the economy, country characteristics, COVID-19 impact and recovery, doing business in Germany, and supporting Canadian exporters with market entry in Germany. Don't forget to type your questions for Jens in the comment box on the right side for our chat after the presentation. I saw some great questions coming through for Christopher, so keep that up. Uh, it's wonderful to have you here this morning, Jens. And now, over to you. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for that introduction and uh, happy to answer all questions, of course, uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, welcome everybody to uh, this session about um, the German market and a guide to doing business. Uh, we will cover some general facts about the German economy, the German market, and you know what are ways uh, to do business um, yeah, with, with German companies and buyers, but also some intercultural aspects um, yeah, of best ways uh, to engage with, with German buyers. Um, yeah, welcome. My name is Jens. Um, I'm Director of Germany at OCO Global, based out of Frankfurt. I'm with OCO for um, yeah three and a half years now. Have a background in economic development and have worked for um, yeah a German EDO in, in trade and foreign direct investment. So yeah, that's my background, and I'm more than happy to um, yeah to uh, present uh, yeah the following um, yeah aspects and information to you. Um, some or maybe uh, more of you will know OCO Global, but just um, by introduction, uh, we are a specialist uh, consultancy specialized in international investment and trade. So what we do is we support international companies with their growth ambitions on an international scale. Um, so as you can see, OCO is headquartered in Belfast. We are a Northern Irish company but we have a global presence um, and also a strong presence in Europe. So uh, myself, I'm based in Frankfurt. That's our uh, main office in, in Germany. We have a second one in Berlin. And in total from 120 consultants globally, uh, we have a team of 12 based in Germany to support foreign companies with their uh, growth ambitions on the German market or German speaking market, if you would like to include Austria and Switzerland as well. So. We are at the center of global trade and investment. So on the one hand, we work for uh, international global economic development agencies, trade organizations or um, investment promotion agencies. Yeah, so uh, a couple of references highlighted on the left, including Atlantic Chamber of Commerce, of course, uh, and, uh, and a couple of others. And um, yeah, so we uh, support uh, EDOs uh, with framework uh, uh, and export promotion campaigns um, yeah, like, like this one um, with Europe. We also support companies uh, directly and engage with companies directly or are contracted by companies directly uh, yeah, with international expansion uh, requests. Um, I will come to that later, what, what the service portfolio is. Uh, so those are um, yeah, the, the, the main groups we are working for. Um, we also have a vast network of intermediaries, multipliers, banks, and everything that is related to international expansion. So we really have an, a, a holistic service package that fits um, to the requirements of companies looking to grow in international markets. Our approach to supporting exporters, and this will be the focus also of um, yeah, the whole program and also of this session, is that we have the network, the global scale, 
and the tools to support um, yeah, foreign companies and exporters with their growth, um, in this case, especially uh, for the German market. So our approach generally is based on three important pillars, uh, assess, enter and grow. So we go from a market assessment, initial research about, you know, what is the economy about? What are the market trends? What supports my business? Um, yeah, what are the uh, key drivers of, um, of, of yeah, exporting uh, in this niche or in this segment uh, to Germany? And from this, we go uh, to the phase entering a market. So we prepare uh, companies and work with them directly on entering a market through distributor search, partner search, buyer identification, appointment setting, matchmaking, everything that relates to that until we have a decision of whether the market is um, yeah, uh, ready to, to, to enter. Um, we work um, yeah, out strategic ways of then engage uh, within the market and really grow uh, the market. And we can support with our networks and our tools um, and yeah, be your in-market uh, yeah, partner in, in Germany as well. So, um, and in, really at the bottom uh, for us, it's, it's communication. And like we engage today, um, yeah, we, we engage also with potential buyers in the German market on behalf of foreign companies. And this is really what, um, what we want to point out here during this presentation also, how to communicate with German potential buyers and partners. And, and I'll cover that in the, in the upcoming minutes. So let's take a look at, at Germany um, and I'll give you a, a broad market overview and also um, highlight some aspects of the business culture. Um, a couple of aspects you may, you may already know, so I'll, I'll go over that quickly. But in the end, the, the most important thing is um, Germany is regarded as, of course, the world's fourth largest economy, but the nar largest national economy in Europe. It's like a, like a powerhouse um, to do business with. Uh, German companies and yeah this is um, uh, what I cover now. So a couple of key facts um, in Germany um, maybe also in contrary to France and this is another session uh, you will hear about. So in Germany there is a federal system. Um, there are 16 federal states uh, a couple of those I've, I've named here and, and this is something uh, special about the German economy because it's spread it's diverse and it's not uh, centered around uh, yeah just a few um, metropolitan areas or so. So um, this needs to be bear, uh, bared in mind. Um, also, uh, Hamburg and Bremen are two federal states, actually, uh, that are there are cities um, next to, to Berlin, of course, as well. So uh, uh, yeah, uh, three cities uh, uh, that are uh, federal states or at the federal state level as well. Um, then of course you have um, you know euro as, as a currency, so you're embedded into the European Union and you know uh, foreign or overseas exporters, um, if they are based also in the European Union, can can profit from the free market within the European Union, uh, and that's also of course a big asset of Germany. Um, the market is the market in Germany with 82.9 million, um, yeah, uh, direct households or, or buyers is of course an asset. Um, I, I speak about the, the B2B potential a bit later. Um, capital Berlin. And of course, uh, yeah, although language, um, the main language is German, of course, the companies in general are experienced to do foreign business. So um, you wouldn't have difficulties to engage with German companies in English. But of course, um, German language skills uh, always are an advantage, but it, it's, it's not that important, I would, I would say. So again, with 82 million uh, consumers in, in Germany directly, it's the largest economy in Europe. And um, yeah, the German economy constitutes for 21% of the European GDP, which is uh, quite a lot, I would say. Um, and, and yeah, the population counts up to 16% of the EU population. And that's, that's a big asset um, yeah, for overseas exporters regarding Europe. Uh, Germany is yeah, considered as the powerhouse um, of the European Union in this regard, and also as a stabilizing force uh, within the Eurozone. One 
um, yeah, aspect of the German economy that needs to be considered always is that this economic strength is driven by SMEs mainly. Uh, so the Mittelstand, how we call it, uh, constitutes um, yeah, 99.5 percent of all companies. Um, and and that's, a, that's a major asset and a thing that needs to be considered. So it's, it's not big groups always that you will have. It's, it's also family owned, um, highly innovative, hidden champions or businesses uh, that might be your potential partners or buyers in the German market. And these companies are very export oriented. So um, the German economy in total is very export oriented, with, which relates back to why uh, the economy is very open. Um, also uh, in engaging with foreign companies. And I think that's a, ge that's a definitive um, advantage for foreign companies. Um, and, and as you can see, a couple of sectors that Germany is um, always or has been very strong in is chemical, automotive industry, but also machinery and equipment and, and every segment that's related to, to these sectors as well. So why, why is Germany so, so yeah, interesting for uh, foreign exporters? Um, just what I've said, I mean, it's, of course, um, an attractive business location based on its economic strength and um, the purchasing power by um, private consumers, but also B2B um, buyers. Um, the German businesses and the Mittelstand, the SMEs uh, that I spoke about, they are used to doing business with international companies. So no big um, yeah, entry barriers. And also, um, yeah, foreign exporters profit from the relations with the European Union. Um, so Germany continues to be a, a very open economy um, and the most open of the G7 countries. Um, it has an excellent infrastructure. Uh, I don't go too much into detail about that, um, but we can we can cover uh, that later as well. And um, in the logistics performance index, Germany uh, ranks first. And also uh, regarding Canada, I mean, Germany is uh, Canada's largest export market in the EU. So that shows that there are relations we can, we can build on. Um, Germany is a, is, a, is a modern, tolerant, uh, cosmopolitan society. Uh, and, and you will experience a good standard of living here um, if also you, you intend of locating business here. And of course, CETA, um, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, plays a big role and, and will play, hopefully, in future uh, in further build upon these relations. So yeah, many reasons why, uh, why to export to Germany or engage with, with, with the German market. Again, what I want to highlight is, is the federal system. And as I have said, um, there is not like maybe in, in France with, uh, you know, Paris or Lyon uh, and, and a couple of others having uh, just some, um, you know, important areas in Germany with the 16 federal states um, that, that you have the economy is, is pretty spread. And you will experience that in all of the 16 lender, you will have um, yeah, industry or, or sector focus um, focuses. And uh, for every business that we are supporting or every foreign company, we always need to look at, okay, where are the clusters you would like to engage with? Where are the buyers? Um, in, in what area, in what region of Germany does it make sense to start with? And then work from there so uh, this is something important to consider and um, maybe it's a bit small to read and, and it doesn't really matter what i would highlight here is that the german federal system is something that is special about germany um, but also makes exporting to germany a bit more complex because you need to have this in mind and sort out um, yeah where to start um, where to start from So COVID-19 is something um, we, we need, to do, need to speak about also in, in this regard. Um, so, I mean, COVID-19 has hit the economy, that's, that's no question. Um, but maybe also in international comparison, um, we, yeah, we can say that up to date, luckily Germany um, has been relatively successful at managing the pandemic. I mean, um, also, what I can say, uh, just by today, vaccination is, is going on. We had a slow start, but now it's, you know, uh, going on quickly. Um, there has been a public health response, um, but also an economic response, um, yeah, to the to the pandemic. And GDP is projected projected to grow by by three percent this year. Um, and yeah, as we go from there, uh, there are positive outlooks at least. Um, yeah, uh, regarding the recovery of the German economy. Um, and yeah, regarding the economic recovery, the German government 
has put a yeah, 50 billion package um, towards recovering from the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, an economic, an economic stimulus package. Um, a special thing about, or a special aspect about this uh, stimulus package is that the German government directly has put emphasis on a couple of sectors that are important to the German economy. Uh, so those are named here. Um, and maybe you, you might recognize some that might be of interest also for your business. So the German government puts emphasis on renewable energies and hydrogen in, 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 in special. Um, and also this stimulus package just last week has been yeah, even enlarged with you know, uh, another couple of billion euros uh, going into the development of the hydrogen economy in, in Germany. ICT and, and digital, the digital economy, uh, below, so 5G, 6G infrastructure, AI, quantum technologies, that's just a huge topic and the German government supports um, yeah, this uh, industry a lot, also through direct uh, recovery money that goes out in, um, in COVID-19 recovery. So I just um, wanted to give you an impression of what the German uh, economy is about and, and what the, you know, main pillars are um, of, of the economy. I would like now to um, talk a bit more about the German business culture. Um, and um, maybe if you have engaged with uh, yeah, German companies or Germans in the past, um, you might recognize that some of these um, yeah, culture aspects um, maybe are true, uh, or maybe you haven't experienced them, then it's uh, also fine. But uh, of course, this is generalized. Um, but yeah, the German business culture is marked by organization planning and perfectionism, or at least um, the Germans are considered um, to be organized and, and, and perfectionist in some way. Um, but I mean, this is always based on one fact, and this is the characteristic of German companies and the Mittelstand, these SMEs, um, and uncertainty avoidance. Uh, so German companies are looking for uncertainty avoidance, uh, yeah, in, 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 every, in every case. And so the management style um, tends to be risk averse. And this relates back to the, to the facts that you can see here, task orientation, analysis, um, need for security. That's something which is important uh, to consider when doing business with Germans. And everything that you know, uh, a business partner can do to uh, reduce this risk or perceived risk for a German company or this uncertainty that will definitely lead to successful business uh, that you will have with, with German companies. So um, I, I already said that we, we might uh, get on that human communication aspect and um, Germany is one of the so-called low context cultures. So that means that um, all details of communication are more or less transmitted explicitly. Um, so you will have, when you do business with German companies, a lot of yeah, business communication in written. Um, again, this is to back up decisions, maintain a record and relates directly to what I've just said, this aspect of uncertainty avoidance. Um, German companies prefer contracts and written agreements of all types. So this is important to consider. Um, you will mm, not really experience something that is transmitted ex um, not explicitly. So between the line um, or subtle communication doesn't so much happening. It, it's, it's really much about explicit communications. In that way, Germans are also reserved and direct and, and pretty much straightforward. And um, we also know from some yeah, foreign companies that we supported in some way that might um, come across rude or very direct. It, it's not supposed to be, or it's not meant like this. It's just this style of communication, right? And again, everything that a that a foreign business company can do to reduce this perceived risk and uncertainty will definitely lead to to good outcomes um, from our perspective. Influencing is always also always um, a big factor, um, and as I said. Verbal subtleties or subtle communication um, is, is not that much appreciated by Germans or doesn't play a big role. So um, one should concentrate on the actual business, less on formalities and rituals. Gift giving is uh, not a big thing uh, in Germany. 
um, and you know big large groups um, and they had some issues with you know uh, accepting gifts or invitations in the past so um, it's really uh, not a, not so much about that the business relations are very formal and uh, one should order uh, one should value the the um, order privacy and punctuality aspect that's important so whenever you engage with um, German businesses um, order privacy and punctuality that's um, that's an important thing uh, to recognize it's all about the protocol um, there are less meetings less and less meetings without an agenda so you should expect an agenda stick to a timeline and and like this uh, yeah the, the, the influencing aspect of a of a negotiation or um, a business relation uh, will definitely move forward. Um, also, an aspect that needs to be considered is that Germans do not need a personal relationship to do business. So, personal life and um, work are really divided um, in, in the German uh, the German business culture. Uh, and this also relates to small talk. Um, there, there, there always is small talk, of course, about soccer or anything else, but it, it doesn't play that big role. And you will experience that the Germans uh, keep the small talk small and then really, um, yeah, just directly address uh, what I've just uh, said, the protocol, written communication, um, come to uh, the context or the topic uh, directly. Um, so that's important, um, important to consider. I mean, negotiating then, um, and this is, I mean, what, what every foreign company in the end seeks with German companies is a contract or an agreement of, of any type. Um, so a couple of aspects to consider when negotiating with German companies is again to uh, follow that strict vertical hierarchy uh, that is established in the German uh, business culture and in many of those SMEs. Um, the decision-making is held at the top, um, and as said, you, you will not experience uh, meetings without an agenda. So um, again, this formal aspect needs to be served and needs to be followed. Um, during these negotiations, uh, you will experience there's always a central idea uh, or a concept that the German business partner has. So it's important uh, to give as much information um, to the German business party uh, that is available. The Germans will look at any detail of, of, of the discussion and, and go over any detail of the information. Um, that's important. Um, it's an engineering culture, as I said. It's a formal and direct culture. The German SMEs, they want to avoid uncertainty, so they will just go over all details. And uh, so this translates into the need of preparation um, for yeah, foreign companies looking to engage. Yeah, and again, um, our contracts are highly unusual. Uh, in the end, it comes down to terms uh, and agreements uh, in the written form and a contract um, within a legal format. And we strongly advise um, to follow this procedure and also take it to consideration Yeah, um, to have legal support on, on this. So again, uh, communication, influencing, negotiating, uh, three important aspects, and I, I hope um, this could give you a bit of a good overview of the German business culture and, and how to interact with, with German um, partners, business partners. Coming back to routes to the German market and um, what is yeah essential to be successful in exporting to Germany, uh, and I've listed a couple of them here. So first of all, of course, it's to understand the market and the target consumer. And the German consumers, they can be quite demanding. Um, and again, just as a business partner, also consumers, they just inform themselves with all aspects. So provide the information, understand what the consumer wants and you know have the content of the product at hand is important. Uh, this directly relates to the market product fit. So um, uh, the product for the German market needs to be fitting um, the, the buyer's expectations uh, in terms of quality, price, packaging, uh, the strategy needs to be uh, adjusted uh, for that according uh, to the buyer behavior. Uh, and this is an, an important aspect. It, of course, this, is, um, this goes for any, any market globally, uh, but I think in Germany there's special emphasis on that. You can learn from competitors. Um, I mean, uh, 
you, you might uh, experience that uh, competitors are already active in the German market, which um, does not need to be something bad or that niche is already settled. So you can uh, look at expansion strategies from competitors or similar companies, similar product providers, um, benchmark your USPs, yeah, and, and, um, and, and adjust accordingly. The market entry strategy should then be discussed and um, there, there are several ways. Um, so uh, we experience that many companies in specific industry sectors are working with um, agents and distributors. Others um, uh, sell out licenses or have a franchise system and even others um, do JVEs or official partnerships with German companies um, and even wholly owned subsidiaries or direct investment in the market is often a preferred option. So then you have a base in the European Union, in Germany, and can serve uh, the EU countries from Germany. So um, these ways need to be uh, discussed, weighted, evaluated, um, and yeah, then you can grow your business in Germany. And this relates to the market ecosystem. Um, so of course, there are direct buyers or direct companies you want to engage with. But there are also organizations, market actors, clusters, multipliers that often can, can leverage um, this growth. Um, and this is also an, an important aspect. The German economy often is organized in such organizations or cluster organizations. So an important aspect to consider. And again, with the federal system, the location matters. So you should um, look at the geography of Germany on your industry, um, your product, and where you find potential buyers in Germany. This can vary from one industry to another. Um, and, and it's an important aspect to consider. Um, and there might be a location you wouldn't have thought at the beginning that fits perfectly in the end to uh, what you look to sell on the German market. So all these aspects we think are yeah, um, important to be considered uh, on the way to the German market. and. Um, of course, OCO um, and our service portfolio uh, directly uh, relates to um, yeah, these needs or um, these uh, market routes. Um, so what I've said at the beginning, our approach is based on three steps, assess, enter and grow. So depending on where you are in this process and uh, at what stage a, a foreign company is looking at the German market, we can then support with a market analysis, market assessment, a competitor analysis, market research, um, to have an understanding of the market before uh, we support with um, the identification of partners, buyers, distributors, sales agents, and really support um, yeah, your um, approach to the German market. Um, again, growing the business um, is an overall goal. And a joint goal that, that we have then with, with our clients, with, with the companies that we support. Um, and yeah, um, with these three steps in our services, we, we, can, we can support uh, yeah, uh, companies with, with German market entry. So yeah, market diversification is uh, key to growth. And the German market itself is, is quite diversified. Um, Europe is open. Um, Thanks to CETA, of course, Canadian businesses can, can profit from that. And um, we, are, we are happy to take this conversation forward. And as said, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer the questions um, that, that um, might have arise during that presentation. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm more than welcome, uh, I'm more than happy to, to answer them now. We are already supporting Canadian companies. So um, just a snapshot of um, what companies we have supported already with um, market entry in, in Europe and also Germany. So maybe you, you recognize a couple of, of, of them um, and might also uh, directly reach out about what their experience was with the German economy, the German buyers and uh, culture. Um, and hopefully these companies um, make the same remarks as we pointed out during this presentation. And um, yeah, that's, that's more or less it. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, it was my pleasure uh, to be presenting in the frame of this uh, program. Um, we are now here. Uh, I am here for um, any, any questions um, that have arised. Um, and you can see here also uh, the contact details if um, you would like to engage anymore. Thank you very much. 
Hello, Jens, and thank you for that informative presentation. Uh, joining Jens today is his OCO Global uh, colleague, Colin McCullough. Uh, thanks for joining us, Colin. Uh, Jens, you shared some great information with our uh, Atlantic Canadian companies, information that I know will help them as they explore the German market more. I can see, thankfully, that we've got lots of questions coming in uh, to, the, to the chat feed, and I'll continue to keep an eye on that. Um, but we're going to roll right into our, our Q&A uh, and get as many questions answered as possible. Uh, I'll also mention that we, we are still trying to get uh, Christopher McLean uh, on the line with us as well, because there's been still some connection issues. Uh, but if we're able to get him, he might pop into the feed here with us uh, to join Jens and Colin. Uh, so before your first question, uh, I'd just like to advise our virtual audience to expect uh, a quick survey pop up on their screen at the end of the uh, Q&A session. Uh, we'd very much appreciate you answering uh, the two quick questions in that survey, providing direction and continuing to provide excellent programming. So let's jump right uh, into the questions for you, Jens. Uh, the first one, uh, very topical given uh, our current climate uh, and the fact that we're doing this virtually today, is, uh, is the German business community uh, receptive to building business connections uh, via virtual meetings? Uh, a very good question, actually. And maybe uh, my answer would have been a bit different a year ago. Uh, so I would say definitely yes. Um, but there has been some education, of course, uh, during the course of COVID-19. Um, but uh, actually, when I when I go on LinkedIn nowadays, uh, I can see just a lot of, you know, uh, pictures and um, reflections of, of conversations that have taken place in the virtual space. And this actually is, um, I wouldn't say it's something new for the businesses, but it has and it, it has become a new reality, of course. So definitely the answer is yes. Um, and also in the German Mittelstand that I have emphasized in the presentation, the German uh, family owned businesses, uh, small and medium sized companies, they also have developed a very good um, understanding of how to use and in integrate these um, yeah, technologies into their daily business. So uh, I would have, I would say definitely yes. Yeah, that's that's good to hear. Obviously, with uh, travel restrictions still in place, that that that's a route for for building those connections. Uh, just out of curiosity, I, and I know you had gone into some of the uh, components of culturally doing business in Germany with the with the virtual building those virtual connections. Do you think there's anything unique that people should keep in mind in terms of doing the outreach to a potential business partner in Germany virtually, or how to conduct those meetings, or is it uh, something that just sort of is would be the the norm for us as well? Well, I mean, usually the norm is to have a formal request or a formal introduction. Um, so still, um, what, what we've pointed out um, in, in these two presentations, actually, also by Christopher, is to uh, stick to that formal aspect of communicating with, with, with German partners and buyers. So the outreach should be quite formal and uh, detailed also. Why are you looking to engage with a certain um, partner or, or a company? Um, but then, um, scheduling a virtual uh, meeting is uh, has become the new reality, and and, and then you really take it forward. Okay, perfect. Uh, so another question that that came in here. Um, so since Germany is uh, federal, are there some places such as uh, cities uh, or states that should be considered as the first point of entry before moving into other or, or possibly more competitive regions of the country? So even even uh, I am not a lawyer. But I say it depends on, right? <laughs> so, um, if you ask the German EDOs of every of of, of each of the sixteen federal states, their answer would be uh, yes. Um, uh, but I would say you you need to look at really what is your product, where are your buyers um, in Germany, and 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 go from there, because um, I mean you will have similar um, infrastructural. Um, yeah, uh, I would say a basis infrastructure, digital and physical infrastructure, but really then the industries and, and subsectors are quite dispersed in, in Germany. And you will find clusters um, that you really haven't thought of maybe in one part of the country uh, that might be ideal for your business to start off instead of just going to, let's say, Berlin because it's the capital. So I, right, I, I hope um, my, my colleagues from the Berlin uh, Economic Development Organization uh, will, will agree with that, but uh, it's just like that. So really have a look at, you know, what, where are your buyers um, and, and what could be the starting point, I think is, is, is crucial. 
uh, but you will have similar, um, let's say, basis infrastructure all around the country. So uh, still, you can rely on, on, on that part. OK, perfect. Thanks. Uh, for this next one, I think uh, maybe we'll get you to answer specific to, uh, to Germany, Jens, and then maybe, Colin, if there's some, something more general from the, the work that, that you do through OCO Global that you could add in, um, then maybe we can go that route. But for, for this one, it's how can a business go about researching the regions uh, to learn more about where to focus our efforts? So maybe what are some resources and, and avenues specific to Germany, Jens? And then what are some maybe some best practices on that from your perspective, Colin? Yeah, thank you. I, I think that is a, is a very good question and, and we can reflect a lot of what we've talked about. So um, to be honest, some, some information, of course, is available online. I mean, we heard Christopher uh, speaking about that and the Canadian Embassy, um, you know, giving some advi advice to Canadian exporters. Um, of course, also the German Economic Development Agencies have some information online on what uh, industries and clusters you will find in each of the 16 German federal states. Of course, there are databases available like Eurostat or the German Statistical Office. But um, while, while talking about that, you also see that the information you might be seeking um, is quite dispersed. Uh, you will invest, you will need to invest a lot of time in, in, in looking for it. And uh, at some point, still, it might remain very generic uh, for some instance. Um, if you, if you look at, at the data that is available online uh, from the EDOs, for example. Um, so I would say this is like the first step or you, you can use and, and leverage that, of course. But the second step is maybe go go further, go further into detail, have a look at maybe niche segments, high growth opportunities. Um, and that maybe we can also come in uh, as CEO and just take the research um, a step further and uh, really be more diagnostic or um, yeah, opportuni opportunity oriented uh, for a particular product, a particular service, um, and, and, and offer um, yeah, some, some market assessment or research in this regard. Maybe Colin, you can just, you can just add on that from the experience we had with, with some of the companies in the program. Yeah, sure. So look at it. it. It's our sort of core business, I guess. So uh, I guess the easy answer would be to say, you know, you can trust us to do it for you. But uh, that's not really uh, the answer you're looking for. But uh, it is obviously available under the, the European Market Development Program. And a couple of things. Um, look, Jens yeah, is absolutely right. And I think um, we typically would look at industry associations as well. They can be a really good source, for example, of data on the, on the, the local companies, who their members are, et cetera, what the key themes are that, that, that are facing the issue, the, the industry. Um, also, into, I mean, trade shows can be quite interesting as well, right? Looking at which of the major trade shows, who's exhibiting, you get a feel for that. I tend to think it's quite interesting to look at your competitors, right? Are they somewhere? You know, where they, if they focus, what's their, do they have references, et cetera, or distribution partners? Where are they? What does it look like? So, I mean, first of all, I'd say uh, the person who asked the question, well done asking the question. I, I, I sort of feel that um, it, it can be too easy to sort of jump to work and I find customers rather than actually doing the homework properly. And, and, and so I do really like the, the, the emphasis on, on the research piece. And that's what we try to do is to try to get that um, right for them. Um, we also look at trade data. You know, we look at imports, where are they going into, which ports, you know, where from, et cetera. So that's really interesting to look at. And, um, you know, we I say we are, uh, you know, uh, we're in this game, if you like. So we have access to databases like Pitchbook, like, you know, Factiva. So, we, you know, we, you don't have to spend a lot of money to, uh, to we, we do that for you sort of thing. But there, so there's lots of, of ways to do that. But um, you can, there's a lot you can get for free. Have a look at some of the Chambers of Commerce stuff as well. Are there any, you know, as well? So, yeah, that would be my, 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 my view. That's great. And and to round that out from, from sort of the local perspective, I'd also recommend, uh, you know, we've got, it's all Atlantic Canadian companies here on the line. Um, also do an outreach to your to your local export development agency uh, to ask what kind of services they might have available to, to help with some of that, maybe the early stage market intelligence that can then be augmented by the things that both Jens and, and Colin spoke about there. So you can really get a nice package of information together when you're looking uh, at a market like, like Germany. 
Um, so we, we got a couple uh, more industry specific questions, which is always nice to see. Um, so may I'll package them up and, and, and you could talk about them uh, together. But um, we have one question around the, the, the value proposition and the opportunity uh, for the pet food industry in Germany. Um, and the other one is around um, the wine market. So for, you know, Atlantic Canadian companies looking at that, uh, you know, pet product industry or, or the wine industry, what, what are some thoughts you have around that, Jens? So a very interesting question. And the pet industry actually has experienced a significant growth uh, also during COVID-19. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, there are major players in, in the German pet industry. Uh, so you might maybe know Fressnapf. Um, that, that's a German uh, brand um, with headquarters nearby. Um, and uh, also with a European presence, and they dominate the market quite, quite, quite much. So there are others, but but this is really uh, one of one of the major players. Um, and as said, there has been significant growth in in the pet food industry. So um, uh, I would say there are major opportunities right now, also for for foreign exporters to to um, yeah leverage the these market opportunities here. Um, and 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 yeah, of course, I mean this uh, business has been quite. Uh, how you say stationary retail oriented, but now you know more and more e-commerce um, platforms are coming into play, and consumers, uh, the, the changes in consumer behavior that we experience in um, yeah our usual food industry, you know, can be um, translated also in, in the pet food industry. So it's a very very dynamic um, industry, um, and, and we see a lot of growth in Germany during COVID nineteen. That's that's perfect. And you have uh, we've done we've done a bit of work with uh, some uh, U.S. companies, you know, particularly around Missouri, going to shows like uh, Interzoo and and and, and then uh, like Zoo Mark in Italy and stuff as well. So we, we we've got a bit of experience on they Yeah, COVID is uh, yeah made people spend money on, uh, on on stuff at home, right? So whether if it's furniture, or it's pets, it's uh, you're in the right business. So uh, yeah, it could be could be interesting to explore. That's great. And another one that just came in, another uh, sort of industry specific one that would be interesting to hear is um, in terms of the, what's the, the market look like in the, the biotech med tech uh, for companies looking to expand or export into Germany? So uh, same as um, the food industry, biotech was one of the uh, industries, you know, that uh, were uh, kind of resistant um, of, of COVID-19. And I think investments in, in uh, capital investments in biotech industry has um, uh, yeah, uh, leveled off the charts uh, last year. Of course, also uh, uh, BioNTech um, and, and CureVac, the two major mRNA um, vaccination providers, uh, you know, they, um, uh, they did an IPO. So of course, um, some of the statistics are related to that, but um, definitely um, there are huge opportunities in, in life science. The German government um, is, is supporting um, yeah, uh, new biotech uh, industries or innovative uh, models and, and R&D incentives in this regard. Um, so again, it has been um, yeah, a, re a resistant uh, sub-segment um, and, and industry, and, and there are huge opportunities in the, in the German market. And then we are working. We are working with uh, with the major major clusters in Germany in the in the med tech industries and life science industries. So uh, we have a network there, and um, you know if there there are companies interested, um, we are happy to uh, to engage them with um, yeah industry associations also in this regard. Oh, that's excellent. Um, so another one that just came in here: uh, Are license agreements to produce products uh, looked at favorably in Germany? So again, I, I would say it depends on, on the sector. Um, so uh, what is the human, uh, hum, um, the, 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 how you say, the, the, the protection of, of uh, the rights of, of the product? Um, but definitely, yes. I mean, I, I see a lot of uh, companies, especially in the, in the tech and fintech space, where your licensing agreements is, is a usual thing of, of uh, partnership agreements. But I can think of other industries where it's maybe a bit more complicated, like in life science, for example, um, where the protection of um, yeah, rights and properties is, is maybe a bit, a bit difficult or, or needs, needs to be considered. But, but we can have a look at that if, if, if that becomes um, a particular issue for for an exporter. Oh, that's yeah, great. Parallel something, you know, sort of align, maybe not exactly on the, on the on the same basis, but one of the companies we worked with um, had a uh, in, in the in the recent um, EMTP program 
had uh, a product that they were trying to sell into health supplement business. Okay, so they have they had an ingredient, uh, sort of secret ingredient, let's say, or one that isn't so common in uh, in Europe. Um, but again, we're looking at you know, do you go to you you know the health stores as a um, uh, as an end customer, or could it be put into manufacturing from you know with some of the other um, larger manufacturers, and they could put it into their product? So that actually turned out to be a better route to market. And so we we have um, those sort of things are, are what we explore all the time, looking at what is the best way to to, to get your product in. That's great. Um, so another one here that I think um, maybe we again maybe get the German specific uh, perspective from you, Jens, and and then maybe some. Um, some of the more uh, general from what you've seen uh, working with companies specifically, Colin, is, um, you know, in your experience, what are the most common mistakes that Canadian companies make uh, in Germany at the beginning of their, their market entry? So maybe specific mistakes that you see entering the, the German market, Jens, and then maybe some general advice from your perspective, Colin, that as when companies are doing a market entry, what are the things that are sort of those common mistakes that could, could easily be fixed uh, with the right, right supports and knowledge? Yes, I would say the common mistake is really not looking at what we've discussed so far, right? And uh, not really considering, um, you know, uh, the, the federal system we've pointed out, um, the, um, the differentiation um, in Germany of particular bio groups and clusters and stuff, um, a part of all the communication and influencing um, uh, stuff. So um, the, the, the common mistake, uh, um, maybe exporters really make uh, is then not to interact properly also maybe with, with the German counterparts. And again, I, I would like to point out that 99% of the German companies are uh, small and medium sized companies with a very particular uh, look and feel, I would say, um, when 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 doing business with, with foreign companies. Yeah. So um, again, I can just, I, I, I don't feel familiar with pointing out you know, this or that is like the most common mistake, but it's really like everything we've discussed needs to be embraced, uh, looked at, um, and um, the decision of how you go into the market, selecting the right market entry strategy, right? Is it through licensing? Is it through a wholly owned subsidiary? Is it through a partner that, that you work together with and a trust building up that trust relationship um, are important decisions, right? So uh, you need to do your homework uh, and, and, and do a thorough market um, assessment and um, doing the homework really is, is, um, is, is key. Okay. Yeah, let me allow a few to, to that and look at, it's not just uh, Atlantic Canadian companies, by the way, it's, it's across the board, but, but just from experience and actually a little bit of experience from the MDP program as well, some things that are worth considering um, are, and actually it's more about your company um, than it is about the application to the market, but um, getting your stakeholders aligned really important so you know i think you know um make sure the management team are are actually you know on board have the same sort of objectives um that we have to be when you're entering any new market you know it does take time so there has to be you know commitment um of resources both financial and human resources so getting that you know aligned up front a realistic time frame about what you do and how you can measure progress rather than just, oh, we didn't sell in the first six months, let's get out of here. You know, so it, it's, 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 it's having that. It's understanding Germany and Europe, you know, it is a competitive marketplace. Um, and, you know, as, as, as Jens said, they are risk averse and they are detail oriented. So if you do go in haphazard into Germany, you will fail for sure. I um, mean, you'll fail in most markets, but I think in particularly in, 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 in Germany. Um, uh, and I think that you, you, there can be a, at times, a sort of um, a lack of, not trust, but a, you, you, you can't assume that what happens in Canada is the same as in Germany. So the whole point of having a local partner is to bring that local insight and knowledge. You have to sort of trust them, right? So, uh, um, you know, it may not feel right. Um, but I think, you know, hopefully if they're the right partner, they'll give you the right advice or the right insights. And I think it, it's sometimes difficult because when you've done it one way in, you know, one or two other markets, you sort of feel, well, it should be the same way, but it may not be. So I think it is keeping an open mind 
and really trusting the the insights and the data and then you know not being afraid to make the adjustments to to, to suit the market uh, that's great thanks thanks to both of you for that for that insight I think uh, I've got time for one more question. Like I said earlier on, you know, if, if I don't get to your question, uh, we'll we'll follow up later uh, to hopefully get you a bit more information. Um, I just want to say thanks to everyone for being uh, having so much engagement. This is great to see so many questions coming in. Um, so the what we'll end off with here today, um, it's specific to uh, food and beverage products, but it, and and around the market share potential. So, um, you know, realistic. Realistically, what is the market share potential for food and beverage companies in Germany in terms of things like, you know, is there a significant buy local movement in Germany? Uh, and and what's the perception of, of Canadian uh, food and beverage products in the market? Yeah, so I mean, sustainability ha has been the headline for a couple of years in Germany and especially in the, in the food industry. And you can see a clear um, uh, customer behavior movement towards more sustainable product, organic food, um, and um, clearly also uh, there has been a, a rapid increase in demand for this product du during COVID-19. Um, people were at home, um, you know, they had time to look at all these things and um, also, um, yeah, um, uh, maybe maybe cook at home and, and um, yeah, care for, care for these things. Um, so uh, definitely, yes, there is a, a huge opportunity and market potential for organic food, everything that is related to sustainable uh, products, sustainable packaging, um, and, and uh, there are huge opportunities for foreign exporters, I would say, yes. And this is not just um, a temporary uh, phenomenon that we see, uh, that, that there will be a lasting impact and uh, German consumers are really looking towards these kind of uh, uh, products. So yes. Uh, just, just to add to that, um, we at the start of the program last year, we delivered uh, sector reports for Europe and we sort of did touch on some of the markets within that. So they, they, I'm pretty sure they're available um, through the Atlantic Chamber. So there will be quite in-depth uh, market reports on the you know, food and beverage sector. So um, Glenn, I'm sure, can, can uh, uh, communicate on, on, on that later. Um, yeah, we, the, the, we have also worked with um, three food, food companies in the, in, the, in the current program, and Germany has been a target market for each of them. So there, there really is a, uh, from what we've seen so far, um, I would say there, there is a, an openness um, to Canadian products, um, and therefore, you know, and a, and a good, obviously, a, a very strong um, consumer market in Germany. And I think because of that health, um, drive and the sort of you know um, uh, traceability, sustainability sort of stuff as well. I think you know Atlantic Canada would be perceived very well in that regard. Yeah, and I mean just just to add on that, I mean it wasn't Christopher's presentation, but uh, CETA definitely has lifted lifted up um, restrictions for agri food companies in this regard. Uh, so um, uh, yeah, less barriers, uh, less market entry barriers uh, to Europe for for agri food companies in general. Um, uh, just yeah, um, pushing these opportunities uh, directly to to yeah Canadian exporters. No, that's great. Um, I wish we had time to get into uh, the rest of the questions. They're they're coming in quick, which is wonderful. But uh, just so everybody knows, you know, we are making note of those questions, and we'll try to to follow up as much as we can with with some additional information. Um, uh, Jens and Colin, if you even want to jump in on the chat there for the on the platform and and start answering, you're free to do that if you'd like. Um, but we are uh, running out of time for this session, so um, I just want to say a, a big thank you to to both of you, uh, Jens and Colin, for